All right, I'm jumping right into this today. We are on part two of the JVC D-Series consumer television restoration process. And this particular JVC CRT, the model number is uh, AV36D501. So this massive 150 pound television was taken apart in the first video and then thoroughly cleaned because unfortunately it was prior to my uh, acquiring it it was owned by someone who smoked heavily inside of it and so this one is uh, it's been thoroughly cleaned and today we're going to get started on the capacitor kit and the, basically the whole board work or uh, what we'd like to call circuit board work here. And we got the chassis pulled, and then I've got all the cards pulled out of the monitor where we've already gone ahead and taken it apart, excuse me, the television. First thing I need to do is get the main chassis out of the black plastic frame. And there were a couple clips that I showed just a second ago. Let's show you, if you pinch those clips, you can pull this board out quite easily. Now, unfortunately, this board had no, uh, there was no service manual that had a direct parts list for these capacitors. So every one of these capacitors that we're changing had to be individually uh, checked and it had to have the location of it recorded. And then I wrote down the value of each capacitor for each section uh, all on a piece of paper. And then as I did that, I would go through and put tick marks on top of the capacitors just so I knew that I had already marked them. And then I could go back and double check if I wanted to uh, reference that with my list of capacitors. But I pretty much just took a small legal pad and I wrote down every little uh, number and then what the value of the capacitor was. So on these circuit boards, there will be a letter C on there that stands for capacitor and then generally a three digit number that you can uh, that will exist only for that one spot and that's how you record where each part goes into and each capacitor goes into so i went through and manually wrote down all 158 of these capacitors what the value was and where they were located and that's how i made my cap kit and again i went through afterwards and i marked every single one off with a black tick mark using a Sharpie. Now what you see here is how I translated that yellow legal pad from a uh, something where I was just, you know, getting the, uh, where I was just taking the values down and then I was turning it into an order sheet. So the left is the white piece of paper is the first thing I worked through. And I want to tell you this just in case you have to, you know, build your own capacitor kit for really anything that you might be trying to restore or rebuild. But I went through first and I logged each different type of capacitor, the voltage, as well as the capacitance or microfarads. And then I was able to translate that over into another list here where I consolidated them and organized them by voltage and then the size as well. And then I could go through from that list and say, uh, eliminate some of these lower voltage capacitors that I might be using the same voltage or I mean the same capacitance on some of these other capacitors with higher voltages so I could just consolidate my order and order less low voltage parts that I that I didn't really need I need one or two parts I could just use a higher voltage replacement which would be fine so after I did that and I made my order I went ahead and while the order was being shipped and prepared, I generally use Mouser as my order place for capacitors, but you can use DigiKey or anything else. Uh, you just go in there and I don't get any kind of a kickback or anything from them. I don't order nearly enough stuff. So what, but if you go in there and you, you make your capacitor list, you can save it and then you can come back and if you need to order parts again or order a capacitor kit again, you can do so. But um, at, while I was waiting for that to come in, I went ahead and I'm using my Hacko FR300 uh, desoldering tool. And this is a really handy tool when you're working on some of these awkward shaped circuit boards, like especially the circuit boards uh, in a CRT that will have your flyback transform in it. And you don't really want to set that down against anything. This one had some awkward tuner parts on it. 
So the best way was just to sit there and heat up that pad. Uh, really, you just heat up the solder. You don't even touch the pad. And as that solder liquefies, you hit the suction trigger on that tool. And it does a great job of pulling that solder away and leaving you with just the tips of your capacitors and um, a clean pad then there afterwards. So I had to go through and do that on every board. Um, I would say that removing the capacitors probably took between an hour and 45 minutes to two hours total for me to do it. Now, some people would probably be faster and some people might be slower than that, but you don't want to try to force anything. You want to make sure, you know, take your time when doing this um, so you don't damage a spot on the circuit board and have to run a trace. Uh, really just any of that kind of stuff is completely avoidable if you just take your time and concentrate and let your tools do the work for you. Uh, so the rest of uh, this desoldering, you know, parts of this video is just going to show me pulling these capacitors. Uh, so, you know, you got to do your best to work around a lot of these. Uh, this double-sided board has small little parts on it. You can't hit them with that uh, hot tip of that desoldering tool. So just concentrate and make sure you don't accidentally tap it into anything or burn a trace or even a connection pad because you're going to need those pads to be in good shape when you try to install your new capacitors. Just some more desoldering here. And once I have all the capacitors out, here are some photos of the board afterwards. There are a couple capacitors on here. These are bipolar capacitors. I left them in there intentionally. And then this big one. Uh, because I wanted to change those separately, but I did change them. This was just for the majority, 99% of the capacitors, and there they all are. Uh, but I just kept piling them up in a Rubbermaid tin, uh, you know, plastic bin. And um, these are what the cards pretty much looked like with the, all the major capacitors removed. And I would go through then after this and definitely need to clean it again. But... I wanted to show you some of the areas on this board that were just obviously high temperature, obviously around, again, the heat sinks is gonna be a high temperature area, but there's a lot of these other parts, especially right here, this was probably the hottest area on the entire CRT right in here. So I went through and after I uh, even did the cap kit, I reflowed the solder on those points just to make sure that the solder was going to be nice and there weren't going to be any you know, issues with the connection points down there considering how high heat it was. And here's some other things now we're going to get cleaning. So even after all that initial cleaning, we need to do some more cleaning with some actual rubbing alcohol on all these boards before I even install the capacitor. So I want to make sure I try to get that extra layer of grime and smoke and other just build up off all the components and especially like these input connections for the composite cables and that's that's just the individual boards and this is the actual entire video card here uh, the the connection points was just really grimy and gross with a, just a lot of buildup so i want to get in there with some rubbing alcohol and and clean that even before i solder in uh, the, the replacement capacitors so um, i'm going to use 91% isopropyl alcohol to clean these parts, and then just an old soft bristle, bristled uh, toothbrush to go in and rub those components and circuit boards and try to get the initial layer of grime and grit off of there, as well as anything else that might just be stuck. And I uh, don't want to make sure that nothing has any opportunity to bridge under that when you reinstall it, but this is majorly a, a job of getting these uh, circuit boards cleaned up and ready for reinstallation inside the television. So this first board is the little F board. That is the input board that would go right in the front of the television, uh, input three. And it was just, again, disgustingly filthy. Um, so it would take uh, you know this cleaning job, and then even after this, I have to re-clean these circuit boards again uh, before I put the entire television back together. So I really like to use that. Uh, the, the tray I'm using is made of just porcelain and clay. It's actually an old, you know, uh, 
wedding registry gift that I really don't use too much to cook, but it makes a good tray to catch uh, these, you know, just isopropyl alcohol and um, not really worry about anything corroding in it because it's clay and porcelain. So it's, it makes a good cleaning surface or good uh, bowl to catch all your cleaning stuff in. And don't be afraid to take that bristle brush and work in around a lot of those small crevices. Try to get as much of that dirt off as possible. And then, you know, the good thing about rubbing alcohol is after you get done cleaning it, a lot of this, the initial uh, chemical will just evaporate off. But if you have any that just stays left over, it's a good idea to go with compressed air and just blow it off. I actually was going to, it's going to be a couple days between when I got this board all ready and clean and all the boards ready to when the capacitors were showing up. So it had plenty of time to sit there and evaporate all the extra rubbing alcohol off. So here's what a capacitor looks, kit looks like when I get it from Mouser. It's literally, I don't know, I think there was like 40 different caps in this, maybe more. And then they're all just in bags labeled. And I have to take my sheet, which I think this was about six pages of uh, a cap kit key and go in and, and I'd sectioned it off by board first. And then there's the board actually had diagrams on it where you, it was labeled like a, a map would be where you could look down and find a square so you could coordinate that with a section on your cap kit. So it was laid out really nicely to be able to come in and do a, a capacitor replacement to uh, just the unfortunate thing was not being able to find a good parts list for it. So for example, I'm going to start with just showing you how I'll resolder the new capacitor. I'll solder the new capacitors in to the uh, little card here, the littlest card. And um, that's like a picture in picture assembly or something. Uh, but it's a very minor card, but it has a few capacitors in it. So we'll change those first. And first thing I do is I take the capacitors from the master lot of them, which is just, you know, the, the big pile over there at the top of the screen. And I find the specific caps that are going to be used for this board. And then I just start going and installing them all at one time on one board, you know, as many as I possibly can. So I'll show you that. Um, just remember, I showed the last thing you might have seen on the screen was my uh, flux, and flux is definitely your friend. Now, I've often get, you know, criticized sometimes about my soldering techniques and how um, I solder on other projects that we've worked on in the shop. And that's fine, you know, there's no, or I don't believe there's one perfect way to solder. And I know that I'm not the best at soldering. So, uh, but flux is my friend and it's your friend and it helps really make these jobs a whole lot simpler. Uh, the first thing I like to do is for right here, I'm sitting this one capacitor in and I've put a bunch of flux on the two connection points there. And then I'll go in and even add more flux to the tip of my solder and go and uh, secure the points on that capacitor. And then I can come in and snip off the legs. And I always come in the very end and refinish my solder by just tending it up because it's already got a lot of flux just built up on the spot. And so I go in there and just, you know, reflow it, make sure it's got a nice, great uh, connection there and that it looks real nice too. And that's how I install um, all the capacitors, at least in this kit. Again, I'm tacking it down initially. I'm knocking off those legs. And then I'll just go back and reflow the solder. And I do that on every single component that I replace on here. So uh, that's just how I do it. Again, there are other people that solder way better than me online. And, you know, you can... Um, it's watch what they do, but this is how I do it. Um, and it's, it's works out really well. Uh, I do end up using a lot more flux probably than I should. And I also, uh, have a lot more cleanup afterwards because all that gooey flux does have to be rubbed off again with alcohol. It doesn't just come off easily. Really. It's, it's nice and sticky, especially when you heat it up. So it'll just take a lot more time to clean up afterwards, but it does a great job on securing your capacitors or really anything that you're going to flow solder on. There's also some points, not on this particular board, but some points on the other boards where 
I again will go in like this and reflow the solder on the old solder points, and that's just in case there's something that I believe has a uh, chance to have a high temperature, uh, extremely high temperature on it. So that's just it for that little board. And we'll take a look here at some of these boards after, you know, before the capacitors were really replaced in them. That's all the boards. And then here's what it looks like after. So we've got all brand new. Uh, this one was entirely Nishikon cap kit. It's just looks fantastic. Uh, at least the way it looks once it's been installed. And this is pre cleaning. So we're still going to get one more cleaning on these uh, components and everything. But this is just what the boards looked like after I replaced all 158 capacitors. And there's the biggest one, the nice initiative on there. So again, I said this last thing is important too, after you replace the capacitors, is go in and clean the circuit boards pretty much identically to the way I cleaned them last time with some more isopropyl alcohol and put it back in the nice tray and just get in there and try to scrub off any leftover residue on the board because even after I'd cleaned it, my goodness, three or four times, there was still plenty of uh, just dust buildup and like smoking buildup on the boards where each time I clean it, I'd still be able to get a little bit more off. And that will be, uh, you know, this is a more of a physical activity, you know, than you might think just having to get in here and clean it. But this, again, these components won't get cleaned by just giving them a simple bath and say alcohol, you do have to put a little bit of pressure on there with a nice, you know, soft bristled brush. That's what I like to use. Um, but I had to go through and do that with every single board here um, just to make sure that nothing was left. I didn't want any of that residue to be left. I didn't want any flux residue to be left over. I wanted the boards to be nice and clean. And that way nobody will really have to service this television again for a very long time. So that's how I recommend you do it. Um, you could, there are obviously other ways to clean it, and I will probably use some of those other methods I've seen other people use, uh, such as using like Mean Green or uh, the you know the green cleaner on circuit boards. Uh, make sure that I just want to make sure that I'm ready for that on something that's not so rare as this D series would be. If something were to happen to one of these boards and I wouldn't be able to get a replacement part, it would be really devastating to have to uh, throw away the whole huge television. So after I got all my uh, you know, alcohol cleaned up, uh, again, a lot of that will evaporate, but it was sitting in it pretty heavily. So I still like to go through with my uh, air compressor and blow off the boards again. And then I let them sit for a day. And uh, after that, I start to go in and re assemble the television, which is exciting because that means you're getting closer to actually seeing uh, if this thing, uh, not, you know, worked, if this capacitor kit worked. So first thing I did was I went in and installed the button boards. That's the, you know, the input board number three, and then the main power button, as well as the control board there in the front. And then after that, I'm going to assemble our entire, you know, uh, internal guts kind of of this television. Uh, the main chassis goes on the, the frame. There's no screws with this one, so it just snaps back into place. And then once it's snapped into place, you can start installing the other cards. And um, there is another board that's an isolation board for power. But first, I'll insert our cards here, three cards. And the third uh, middle-sized card uh, does have the tuner in it. And you need to make sure that you reconnect that tuner to the main connection point on the chassis and then you can use that black piece of plastic that goes against those inputs and it'll uh, securely hold those boards into place and then last there's the isolation power uh, cabling and, and set up there so you you know you got your power input coming in there and then you've got some molex connectors here at the end to go back and connect together and um, I like to connect as many of these things as I can while the whole thing is out, which there are a few connection points. There's usually two or three that will go from the main uh, board up to the neck board. And that's the way it is with this one. There's two of those. And then there were some other boards that needed to be reconnected. But the good thing is, is each one of those little connection points, these Mullex connectors, 
is generally going to have a, a unique number of pins to it. And then it will also have a number that's written on it or a letter in this case that tells you where they go and what happens, you know, where it goes after that. So I want to show you this right here. Did you just see that huge bump on the screen? I hope you did, because this was the point where I almost entirely screwed up this entire repair. Uh, and I wanted to show it to you because it was kind of a knucklehead move I tried to make in the first place. You see the connectors on these little boards that I installed first. I should have gone ahead and put the cables on them before I installed it, but instead I decided that I didn't want to, uh, that I wanted to just wait and, you know, install it later. And I actually got frustrated and I wasn't used to working on such a large tube and I knocked the top of my head against the CRT uh, electron gun and glass and the yoke. And man, it not, you saw it jump on that, uh, on that video. You saw how it rocked the whole CRT back and forth. And it really hurt, so I'd made a mistake by just not paying attention to my surroundings. I'm not used to working on such a large tube, so uh, I would have been devastated if that had really done a lot of damage to the tube that was pretty much irreplaceable at this point. But that was, uh, that was definitely a scary moment in this whole restoration was the moment that I actually jumped up and hit that with my head, plus it hurt really bad. So uh, it would have been a lot easier and simpler for me to have connected that cable uh, before I had installed that board into the actual television and then I could have connected it later onto the main chassis. So I've got pretty much everything connected here. I'm just doing a final check on things that are connected. There's a few things that uh, still need to be hooked up like the degaussing coil that always stays in place but the, all those Molex connectors get connected into place and then after that I'm going to uh, connect the neck board next it's going to be the neck board and then finally the anode cap because we're going to do something special with that anode cap here in a minute. But I'll put it up here and uh, just connects straight into the connections. Uh, there's also three or four Mullox connectors that need to be you know, secure up there. So just double check those. And then we're going to get here and get into the anode cap. Before we do that, look at this yoke. It's very unique and weird. Um, it's held into place with some epoxy like spacers those white things are actually spacers in the corners of the yoke against the glass that i just touched it'll come into focus here but also notice on this yoke there's no rings to just purity or convergence or really anything uh, there's just a, a yellow solid ring around there now there is a screw if you need to get the yoke off but again it's epoxied into place so it's going to be very limited on any kind of adjustment we can make we'll have to use whatever's available in the service menu and then um, have to manually add magnetism to this television to make really any difference with his corners at this point. So the last thing I did was I cleaned off that connection point on the back of my television with some alcohol. I didn't record that part, but I did just take a little wipe and put some alcohol in there because I wanted to get rid of all that residue. And I reapplied some new dielectric grease. This is what I bought. It's available online. It's called Permatex is the brand. And it was about $10 for this tube, which is plenty. And the first thing I did was I went in and applied a good la layer over everything inside the anode cap. I used an, a little latex glove, which I didn't have all on all the way. I just put my finger in it and rubbed that around. Uh, and I got the entire thing covered in that grease, including uh, the metal part there. And I also took some of that dielectric grease and applied it to the back of the television where this is going to connect to. That was also very important. And don't worry about it. There's not a specific amount of this you need to apply. You can use a little bit, you know, you can go a little bit heavy on it. It's not going to hurt anything. Just make sure there's enough to get you a good seal between that um, this lubed up anode cap and the back of the CRT. So that's going to be the next step is just connecting that in the back of the television. Uh, up here and you can see where I've already had added some of that uh, lubricant to the back of the tube. Now when you put this cap back in it's best to rest the little one of the sides of the two prongs on the cap against the black ring. You rest rest one side and then you pinch the other side down like I'm doing here. Pinch it down and it pushes together and then it'll stick right in there and spread out and it'll be a good connection and then you just push down and get all the oxygen, as much of that as you can, out of your uh, suction cup. And you've got a good bond there. 
with your dielectric grease and everything. And I just went back behind there and cleaned up that area a little bit, but don't worry about it too much. You can have the extra dielectric grease. It's not harmful at all. And now the television's pretty much, you know, all reassembled. And now we're going to get a chance to finally test it, which I'm excited to do. But I'm also very nervous about, and uh, before I even test it, I'm going to let it sit for a while. So I'm going to let it sit for a day open like this and uh, just let anything that might be on there as far as cleaner that's left over, I'll let it all evaporate out. And then the next day before I even test it, I went ahead and uh, reinstalled the shell because I didn't want to risk anything by just trying to turn this television around without the back shell on it and have the weight disproportioned and actually cause something to get damaged, just trying to turn it around. So uh, unfortunately, I had to pretty much reassemble the whole thing before I even got to test it, which is not generally the case. I usually will leave it open and try to test it and then make some adjustments. But the fact is, there's not a whole lot to adjust on the chassis. There was only one, the only potentiometers are in the back of the actual flyback. So as I said, I'm going to go ahead and let this sit now for another day before I actually turn it on. And what I'm plugging in is I'm using the component input for the test that I'll be running the next day. And that's going to be uh, using HD RetroVision's component cables through a Super Nintendo that has had Voltar's RGB mod in it. It's a one chip. And again, I'm just going to set this all up and let it sit here. And then um, over the next day, I did take some alcohol and clean up the outside of the television some and remove some of the stickers that I had on there before. But again, this is the very first time powering it up, and thankfully it powered on. And man, this was nerve-wracking because I turned it on and I got this jumpy, crazy screen, and I was like, what's going on here? But I remember my, my uh, Super Nintendo, it, it acts funky sometimes, and I have to like reset it a lot uh, because of... Either power issues, could be a bad power supply unit on there. And uh, I just reset it and it worked perfectly. So you saw the little dimming I did there. That was from the HD RetroVision cables. And they have a very nice dimmer switch on there. And that helps when you're doing some adjustment or anything. We just need it to be either brighter or uh, not so bright as quickly as possible. And the first thing I did, this is literally within the first two minutes of this television being powered on. And I set it up with the uh, component input, and we're we're playing Metroid Three or you know Super Metroid, uh, letting it letting it play, and and I mean, it looks great, it looks fantastic for just bright, no adjustments right off the get go. You will notice the curve at the corners how it bows a little bit, but remember this this is not a flat Trinitron tube. This is a 36 inch bowl shaped tube, almost like your eye eyelid. So it does curve at the uh, corners and out at the tip of the front of the screen. So of course, I wanted to just show some initial readings here from the Super or the test suite on the Super Nintendo, the 240p test suite from our TMEO, and just show you some of these grid patterns. We still can use a little bit of adjustment here on our uh, things like our geometry, but overall it looks very nice. And I was especially impressed with the linearity of this tube. Uh, 20 years old, still has great, fantastic linearity, just round, beautiful circles. But we still still do have the issues in the corner uh, in the corners with the convergence, specifically the red gun on here. It just seems to be burning out a little bit more than the other two colors. I'll show you that uh, more specifically here in the test I did with my convergence tool lens. I pulled up a white line pattern. You can almost see it without the lens. But if I show you uh, what it looks like inside the lens that separates the colors. You can see that red gun in the corner is extremely uh, low compared to the other two, uh, blue and green. So that's why I'm seeing that red on the edge, bottom edge of my white line patterns. And again, the only way I can probably adjust that is to manipulate it through magnetism internally. So we'll try that in the next video as well as I'm going to locate a proper, uh, a proper remote to be able to calibrate this fully and then uh, we're going to add RGB to it because why wouldn't I add RGB to it at this point so that's going to be coming now it will be a little bit of a break between now and that video coming because I've got some other things I've got to take care of uh, before I get this one completely upgraded and I want to wait for some uh, research to come back on some parts for the RGB mod but look to that to come and I'm going to have about 
12 minutes left on this video and I get requests a lot to just see what, you know, what does it look like afterwards? So since this was such a big capacity replacement restoration, I wanted to show the screen uh, just what it looks like right afterwards. I've got 12 minutes of play through here. So please just enjoy it and let me know what you think with a comment. And if you have any questions, leave them for me below. And again, I will see you guys next time with some more retro content.